All right, welcome everybody. Well, I don't need to introduce myself. I know you all pretty much, maybe you less, but everybody else is fine. <laughs> Okay, so this is, this is my talk that's based on a lot of the questions that I've gotten over the years and some of the insults that I've also gotten over the years. And so this is kind of a, an exploration of how I've learned to deal with people on the internet uh, because a lot of them can be pretty hostile and I think that's because on the internet you're basically anonymous so you don't have uh, you're not trying to protect your reputation, especially if you're using a, uh, a screen name that doesn't involve your own name. So that's why a few years back I decided to use my own name on all my stuff just so that I would be accountable to myself and to my reputation and not say things that I ought not to. Well, that helps promote your business. Right, that too. I, I, I don't want too many people to, to hate me because that could affect the bottom line. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying it's good for your business. It's good for my business? Yeah. To, oh, my name. To re re represent yourself honestly. Yeah. Because people will agree with you a little bit. Oh, this is someone I can get on board with and yeah. to actually see your video. Yeah, and this is me. Like, I'm not hiding behind anything or making a persona. This is really me. And if you come meet me in person, it's going to be me. So. It never occurred to me that anybody could get that emotional about these that I would need to have any kind of anonymous name. That's true. I just put my real name on there because I thought, well, we're just talking about these. I mean, it's not like that this is religion or politics you know, <laughs> where things can get really heated. <laughs> I had no idea <laughs> what I was getting into. I would I have no idea how hostile things can get. Yeah. So, so those of you, how many of you have spent a lot of time on the internet, on forums and stuff like that? I Most everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys have, you guys have seen some of the opposition that treatment free beekeeping gets. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So the, the number one rule that I came up with with dealing people on the internet is just don't argue with them. You can't ultimately change anything. You're not going to change anybody's mind. Debates don't really. 99% of the time aren't going to change anybody's mind. All you're going to do is entrench two sides of an argument. And it, it's just going to, it always separates into two sides when it's a winner take all situation. And you're never going to prove anything to anybody because they can always come up with uh, a reason not to believe you. I mean, that's the reason why there's religion and irreligion. It's the reason why there's us and them. It's the, everything naturally divides into two groups. So you've got to figure out a different way to get around that. You've got to come up with uh, a third way, as some people say, third way thinking, or um, some sort of way that transcends the binary, the dualism. So in our case, the best argument for what we do is not to try and prove to anybody that it can work through reason or science or uh, whatever is just to show that we are already doing it. We don't have to prove that it works. We just have to keep doing what we're doing and no one can argue against that. It is as it is. It just is. Another good rule is never call people names. As soon as you resort to calling someone names, you've basically lost the argument. You've triggered their fight or flight response in their brain, which shuts off their ability to reason. And so any sort of logical reason discussion is over. So that's always my number one rule is don't call anybody names. Um, now you can fudge that a little bit if you want to say like you're being a jerk or something. No, don't do that. Um, but that's, you can kind of tell when you start getting into that, that neighborhood. So stay out of that neighborhood. Just state what you're going to state, say what you're going to say. Don't make it more than it is and, and don't retaliate. Be nice. I guess that goes without saying. Um, there are some really great and knowledgeable treatment-free beekeepers out there who are 
who can't follow rules, who can't be nice, who can't not call names. And so this sort of thing happens. This is a, a treatment-free beekeeper who has had to leave the Facebook group a number of times because he refuses to not call people names and refuses to not keep the language down for children and whatnot. Um, so this is actually false because he wasn't kicked twice. I, he was asked to leave the first time <laughs> and he left by himself. So that's what happened there. It may have been three times by now. I don't know. Uh, know your audience. In our case, a lot of the people that we're talking to are never going to believe us. Um, so again, it comes back to the point of don't waste your energy. Don't throw pearls to swine. There's, there's lots of sayings we could use. Um, this is a good example of a person who is, as, a, as an uneducated person in the realm of psychology, I can only assume this person is mentally ill. I have come across this person a number of times under different names. This time he used the name Polly Maine. He is Australian. His first name is Daniel. You've probably come across him as well. Uh, so in my case, I generally let people, as, as the administrator of the group, in private messages, I will let people get their frustration out, let their frustration out on me because it's not going to hurt my feelings. And so I, I let them talk and let them, let them dig their own grave many times as it will. Like, uh, if you know, you go tell somebody, hey, you really, you, you shouldn't call people names. And then they, they call you a, a list of names and you're like, well, you just kind of proved your point. It wasn't an accident. You're not sorry. There's no reason to continue this conversation. So that's what was happening here. I was just saying, he was saying, well, you've got all these problems. I said, okay, so lay them out for me. He said, again, really? So I said, okay, so don't, whatever, I don't care. And so he lays them all out for me, which as you can see, are all totally related to a beekeeping forum online. Um, yeah, see, so I'm, I'm simplistic and violent and have lots of insecurities and all this personal stuff from this person who's never met me once and lives literally on the other side of the planet. Is this old time? No, that's, that's Alistair. <laughs> this is Daniel B. Shepherd. Al what is Alistair's last name? <coughs> anyway, yeah. His name's Alistair. If you do some Googling, you can find him. I think he lives in New Zealand. What's that? I am mad. That's his last name. Okay. Oh, I am mad. Um, so, yeah. Can I add something? Sure. <coughs> I have posted on forums and have had my post removed because it was a heated debate. And I didn't say someone was stupid or I didn't like call them out for anything, but I said what they presented was hard to take serious and and I didn't want to like totally be like I can't take you seriously person whatever um, it was mostly like I don't really view this scientific research as legitimate and but I didn't say it like that but I <laughs> kept getting censored and it wasn't because I was calling people's names but I was Basically, what they thought, saying that their ideas and opinions didn't matter. And that's something that turns real quickly into name calling and, and heated, you know, go nowhere argument is saying your idea you're presenting is um, it's insignificant or it doesn't deserve attention. I would say, I would avoid even going there or just belittling any, anything anyone says or presents as their case. Just go around basically what you're saying. But, um, yeah, you could say something like, I see how you could think that, or I see, from, from, from your point of view, I see how you could think, I, you know, see how you come up with this idea. Uh, but based on this, it doesn't seem to me to be, you know, you, and that's, that's kind of deflecting that that triggering mechanism that's going to that's going to trigger the fight or flight because a lot of times when you attack somebody's idea when you have someone who's not well disciplined 
When you attack their idea, they're not going to feel like you're attacking their idea. You, they're going to feel like you're attacking them. And that's going to end any logical discussion also. So is that the L that's censoring you all the time? No, this was actually on Fermi's.com. Uh, I don't know. I've never been on there. It's a permaculture website, but it was about me. I've seen the site, but I've never been on the meeting part. It's, it's pretty well known. Um, so the question that seems we've been coming into a lot lately is mite bombs. Um, so there's a perception out there that the typical newbie treatment-free beekeeper gets a package of bees and creates a mite bomb by not treating it. You, I'm, you're all nodding your heads. You all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. In my case, I started just rolling with the punches and started making up rumors about myself. So I told them, hey, I make, I make moth bombs. I leave hives out that are dead and they get moths in them and then moths fly out into the neighborhood and kill all the hives with moths. And by, by doing things like that, by, by being part of groups where, um, where people are making fun of each other, people can see me as somebody who's not being precious about things. People can see me as I am, as someone who doesn't take this all that seriously. I'm happy to laugh at myself. Uh, I'm happy to admit when I'm wrong or when I've said something stupid or, uh, you know, if I were to <coughs> fart on camera. I mean, it's, it's all out there. I'm not going to edit it out later to make myself look better. Now, that being said, that being said, a lot of these pictures are cropped to make me look better. I'll just admit that. <laughs> I'll admit that up front. <laughs> so <laughs> back to the question at hand. Um, mites are everywhere, right? You're not getting your mites from me. Your mites, are, you already have them, okay? And so the, the idea that I'm providing you mites when more of your hives are dying than mine are is just kind of ridiculous. and. And like uh, Mike was talking earlier about somebody who did the math on how many swarms are lost by commercial bees. I think I've heard Joe talk about it too. Commercial bees lose hundreds of thousands of swarms per year, which end up in houses and trees and rocks and buildings and, and they end up all over the place. And none of those bees are treated. And those are the bees that really have to be treated or else they're going to turn into mite bombs. My bees don't really have big problems with mites, so mite bombs aren't really that big of an issue. And even with a newbie who is buying a package and may cause a mite bomb, first of all, that package is a mite bomb because it was designed to be, because it was treated. Um, exactly, and generally, I'm not that worried about mite bombs because hives usually die during a time when there's no flight, when it's cold. And so when they do get robbed out, the bees are long dead, the mites on the bees are long dead. There's not a whole lot of mites to be spread around. But um, it, it comes from the assumption that treating means your hives live, not treating means your hives die. No, the and the thing is, if you look at the numbers, I have the numbers later. Um, so this is, this is one of those things where we, where we see that, where I'm being blamed for the mites because I'm a treatment free beekeeper and like you already have mites. I'm not even giving you my mites. I don't even have that many mites. It's not a problem for me. Um, one of the questions we get is why not treat, you know, use something relatively harmless like oxalic acid and then requeen the hive later, next spring or something. What that's doing is that's, for me, that's removing the selection pressure. Yeah. Uh, in the University of Florida just came out, they're recommending that process. Are they? Uh, they yes. Are. yes. Yes. My question in that case would be, give me the name of one beekeeper who succeeded in, in converting to treatment free successfully using that method. No, Nobody. It's a great idea. Doesn't seem to work. <laughs> okay. It's being promoted by some of the most popular academic people on 
the circuits. I mean, yeah. Tom, even Tom Seeley and Marla Spivak and that's, others that's are, the promoting, are promoting this stuff. Yeah. That's the butterfly group. Is Tom Seeley treatment free? Well, no. Is Marla Spivak treatment free? <laughs> Is Randy Oliver treatment free? No. Then don't talk to me about their ideas of how to be treatment free. Michael Bush is treatment free. I'm treatment free. Talk to us about how you do treatment free. <laughs> Dee's been treatment free for decades. Like if you want to talk to somebody, talk to somebody who's doing it. Yeah. I have been trying to do this exact thing. Um, you don't, from bar cell. You don't have any um, vegetables on you, do you? No. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> The uh, uh, bees that were bar cell that went treatment free to not live. Um, I was trying to regress um, to get some small cell cleaning. I first started with 4.9, it was mostly a disaster. I finally got to 5.1. That was still hard. Mm -hmm. I finally got some Man Lake EF 100s and a couple boxes super cell. And by that time, I had decided until they're 4.9, I'm going to treat them at least once a year or twice, whatever I think, until I get down to small cell size. And then I can hopefully ease off the treatments. Now, I, I haven't done it successfully. No, that's why many super cells on the market. You've got to go full bore. For no, I mean, I finally got yeah. small cell comb this year. Yeah. Um, regressing from 5.1 to 4.9, uh, or, um, but they were treated these or in the spring, and I decided that all the ones that actually made it to 4.9 I didn't treat. But that was the fault. I don't know if any of them lived, but I finally got down to small cell high, so now I feel I can not treat, but. I, I don't know. I would still maybe recommend people you, until they get to small cell. I don't know. That's just what I decided to do because everything else wasn't working. You may be the first. We shall see. And probably not because I don't have them So a couple of these things on here we've talked about uh, in previous talks with hybridization and mongrelization and how they get mean when you bring in bees from outside. If you're making your own queens to replace the queens, those aren't issues. But if you're buying queens to replace your queen, then you're going to have issues with, with bees getting nasty and stuff by mixing genes. Maybe. Not always. Sometimes. Um, but the thing about with a hive that is having a problem, like with a, you know, you can see has a good load of mites, you don't know how many mites that hive can handle until you actually try. I tell the story all the time about this hive that I had that I opened it up and it was just infested, absolutely covered, infested with mites, and I just gave it up and gave it up for dead, and it didn't die. So I know that hives with amazing amounts of mites can, at least for a while, survive. So I want to give them that chance. It and also, because if they're on small cell and the bees fan out in the circle where they uh, equalize out in the area they're in from large to small. It's the small cell helping the big ones by taking mites from them, knowing they can live on their backs the way they have for millions of years, and just clean their hairs and carry them from plant to plant. And you get the case where our hives deal with mites better than everybody else's hives, so instead of creating mite bombs, yeah. we're actually creating mite black holes. Yeah. The mites are getting sucked into our hives and dealt with. Our hives are helping the big ones, and they don't want any of that toy. It's a little game play that's been going on, on for, man, you can't believe. And it all started with the butterfly group when they found out how they got conned down in Brazil and Argentina and Spivak and them reading the classified files showing how mites were there pre previous. And then they upsized, which wasn't wanted and it was fought. They said they were going to get even. And you can go down the holes of the people that were there waving their arms in the hills and a lot of that stuff is still on the internet and where but the people people that did it are now long dead because all of a sudden they they were found 
Well, I'm not going to go into that knowing what happened to some of the people, but uh, fighting the politics, but uh, to know it's confidential files and Spivak and me and Otis and Winston and the whole group played the con games and blackmailed them to, to get the control of the colleges that they're overseeing. Hey, that's not out for the general public. The con games and all that crap that went on. And if you broadcast, look what I went through with my, my husband dying with all the stress, the fire burns, they tried to burn us out in 2000, the gunshot fights up in the if people don't un understand one bit how serious things can get. There's a lot of nasty people in the world. Tell me about it. But you got to keep going and play the game. And it's like being in Vietnam in the military, right? You know, it's, it's non-stop battle. But you at least get it, you know, and you got to do what you got to do. You got to do what you got to do. And I'm, I'm trying to spread the word. So this is a good one. Uh, a lot of times people get treated, get booted for saying something like this. Like, why can't you just treat them and then, and then requeen them later? And I'm just like, you know, this is great. This is an idea. It's not an idea that I've seen that works. And you are free to go tell someone else about it. We don't want to hear it. And then they get mad and stuff happens. So one of the arguments that I've been hearing lately, which seems to make even less sense, is that hives are unnatural. We're keeping hives in unnatural man-made, or keeping bees in unnatural man-made hives, so we need to treat them to compensate for all the damage that we're doing to them. Well, first of all, that's an excellent, um, that's an excellent argument for not being a beekeeper. So that's not helping you. Uh, but, but the thing with bees is that they are not a domesticated animal. They're not a pet. They're not a rabbit that you keep in a cage you have to feed and water. They'll die. They're literally, their job is to go out, get food, and bring it back to you. That's what they're supposed to do. And they do it well, and they do it just fine if you let them. Yeah. So we have um, us, we treatment-free beekeepers. Again, this is a case where we can just show you, look, we've been doing this for a long time. It's simply bogus. You can, it's like, it's like saying that a heavier than airship cannot fly. At one point, it was common sense, but it was never true. So this is um, when people come after me and try to, try to troll me and do nasty things to me. As you can see, this person's name is Solomon Parker. You can almost barely see it there. And his, <clears throat> his Twitter handle is at Solomon Parker on Twitter. And I can only imagine the grief this guy gets in my place <laughs> because this is not me. <laughs> so I've, I've actually, yeah, this is, I don't look awesome. This, I've actually had people uh, say that they're like, you know, send messages to at Solomon Parker on Twitter thinking that they're getting me and they're not because that's not me and my Twitter account is, pri is not private, but it's, it's anonymous. So if you, want, if you want to follow me on Twitter, come talk to me later. I'll give you my, uh, I'll give you my handle and you can, you can follow me. But just so you know, there's no beekeeping stuff. It's pretty much all religion and politics. So you can <laughs> that's where I get that part of my life out and leave the rest of it out of the beekeeping. Oh, there's a spelling mistake there. So why not use things like soft treatments, oxalic acid or uh, thymol, or I don't even see, I don't even know treatments that well because I've never ever used them. Why are they soft? Why are they soft? Because if you were, synthetic? if you were to drink them, you wouldn't die like you would if you drank Kumafos or something. Die. Well, I mean, Small amounts. The, the key uh, yeah. Molecularly it depends is, the amount. It's the structure, yeah. it's the structure of the molecule. It's a synthetically created molecule in most cases. So well, and, and really nasty chemicals like Kumafos, like literally, will kill you. Like it is a dangerous formic chemical. Formic acid is not soft, nor is oxalic acid soft. They, yeah, they it's considered soft. soft. So you could say like like powdered sugar or something. 
That would be salt. Let's just say we're talking about powdered sugar. Because <laughs> I've eaten a lot of powdered sugar in my day. <laughs> and it's probably going to kill me, but later on, you know. Uh, but this is the same thing with treating in general, is you're, you're stripping the bees of their ability to deal with mites on their own. Not to mention, if you look at the Bee Informed National Survey, a lot of them don't really work well or at all. So what's the point of doing it if it's not even going to work? The, the, the reason they're calling them soft is, as opposed to your typical insecticide, that it affects the, the metabolism and or the, the neural, the, the, the neur neurons, the neur it's not a neurotoxin, you know, like comopos is a neurotoxin, so it's affecting the the bee as an organism directly affecting some part of that organism that's necessary for it to live. <coughs> Formic acid is just an organic acid. If it's at high enough levels, it, it, it kills the mites. And if it's higher levels, it'll kill the bees. But, but it's, just a, it's just an organic acid. It doesn't systemically affect the bee. Yeah, but essential oils do that? Well, well, I'm, not, I'm not defending it and saying it's a good idea. I'm just explaining why they call it soft treatment. I'm yeah. doing I'm not saying I want to do it. I'm just saying. And the things like essential oils are the same for bees as they are with humans. There's no proof that they do anything. There hasn't been... Well, they're an antimicrobial. Well, they kill viruses and those oils that you put on your body long-term kill humans, but they don't tell you that for how you put the stink pretties on your skin. You put the what on your skin? Stink pretties. Stink pretties? Oh, okay. Stink pretties. To smell like a flower, so the bees come at you, so you squat and go on. <laughs> Is that like when you drip some some uh, lemongrass oil on somebody when they're not looking, when they're out in the park? Sometimes. I've, the essential oils. I've heard of doing that. People drink and run on for you know for rashes and wrinkles and all this other stuff they're tooting nowadays. Long term, that's not good. It's like my uh, my wife's grandmother is a big fan of essential oils, and so I'm whenever she's around, I'm like, pick one. I can't just differentiate the smells. Just pick one, and you smell great. But all of them, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> essential oils actually have studied a lot. There's a lot of research on them, and there's actually lots of health benefits, usually in the form when they're still from the plant. Basic herbalism. And when we distill them into concentrates, they perform many other functions. Some of them are lethal. Like you take a drop of um, wintergreen oil, so you used to make root beer. You put it on your skin, or a few too many drops, it might kill you. So every essential oil is different, and they all range in toxicity to us. You probably shouldn't be putting a lot of essential oils on your skin, but in really low amounts, there's actually very good therapeutic effects. When people talk about, well, if I plant thyme or rhubarb around my hive, the bees gonna, it's natural. The bees will, they'll bring in the the oils and they'll they'll take care of the mites. And I'm going, if the bees do that. Great, that's their problem. But if you're going to plant plants around, that's not beekeeping, that's gardening. Yeah, but it is also, I mean, where we found the, the apigar, the thymol, is from thousands of centuries of herbalism, um, where you, we use these things to treat ourselves already for lots of different things. Um, I don't really use any off the top of my head but there's, there's a lot of evidence suggesting benefits to it. So that's why everyone's so gung ho on. I'm not really into the doTERRA and all the, you know, doing that stuff, but I mean, look at us. We're using lemongrass essential oil to trap swarms. We're definitely getting the benefit out of it. Well, that's part of the problem with just saying essential oils. It's like, which one? Yeah. You know, for what purpose? And for what purpose? You know, lemongrass, lemongrass oil, I know the chemical constituents of it. I know the, why it works as a, as a replacement for Nasanov pheromone. The other stuff, trying to use it for treating is like, I don't know that stuff. I don't want to, and, and, and even if it does work, I don't want to use it because I want the bees to be able to deal with it on their own. Oh, yeah. 
that, that's more and more what I've done over the years where I was told to pull back and see how it coincides with nature. And the older I get and the more I want it to coincide with nature, the stricter I get and people say, D, you don't do that. <laughs> but you got to. Because even water done wrong kills, and that's been known for centuries. Just like anything you put on, on your skin or eat. It depends on what you're doing and how it matches nature for how it's literally used. Mm -hmm. And you either match nature or you don't. So one of the ones I get pretty often when moderating the Facebook group is freedom of speech. You're restricting my speech. It's against the law. You're going to get sued or charged by something. Okay. Well, I get that on what I did because I say, look, read the home page. It says no essential oil acids or breeding or sizing wrong. You know what I mean? And I'm Oops. very strict on that. Now, I have read the Constitution. And the, the First Amendment particularly talks about freedom from the government controlling your speech. I'm a Facebook group, not the government, so this doesn't apply to me. But it is a public forum. That's great. And you have, if you say anything in public, you have the consequences of your words. It has nothing to do with the government. It has nothing to do with freedom of speech or the First Amendment. Yet, yet, um, people that pay taxes to the government technically control the government, not the ones in Washington. They don't want that out. <laughs> That's a topic for another day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, the question that we talked about earlier. Uh, basically the same and, and I have basically the same answers like show me somebody who's done it this way show me somebody who through doing mic checks and figuring out a certain threshold and then only treating when it gets to that threshold or whatever the only way it's ever actually worked is with American foul brood because you just kill the hive and it gets rid of it but treating the hive you're stripping the natural resistance, you're, you're eliminating the processes of natural selection and you're creating bees that are not going to do you any good if you're not there to take care of them. And that's not what I want. Now in, you know, uh, testing for hygienic behavior like, uh, like Marla Spivak's done so much with, um, with liquid nitrogen. You know, you have a little ring, you pour the liquid nitrogen on the comb. And I don't know about you, but my bees don't come in contact with liquid nitrogen all that often. So testing for liquid nitrogen stuff, I just don't think that's very useful. I know this is kind of funny. But no one, no one watching that this is gonna get that. Okay, well let's talk about it a different way. She pours liquid nitrogen on the comb to kill the brood and then the bees discover that the brood are dead and they pull the, the, the brood out. But that's a whole different thing than a mite being in the comb. So the, the test, the, the test is, a, is, a, is, a, it is an analog for the actual thing you're looking for, but it's not the actual thing you're looking for. The actual thing that I'm looking for is survival. Well, yeah, but you said this earlier. There were, the idea is that you're selecting for mangoes, Michael, hygienic behavior. But you're actually looking for hygienic behavior of mites under a cap, not just a frozen one. No, we don't actually select for hygienic behavior. Yeah. We select for survival. No, I'm, okay. And we just happen I'm to see a high test. incidence of hygienic behavior in bees that happen to survive. That and that's. So that's what happened with Minnesota hygienic bees. They're really hygienic. Like that's that it's right in the name. But the problem is that works well for American foul brood that doesn't create treatment free bees. It works when it only happened to be an accidental discovery that it worked for American Falbrood. It wasn't the purpose of why she read that. Well, the funny thing was, people were creating American Falbrood resistant bees decades, centuries even ago, by letting it happen, breeding from the bees that it didn't happen to. Working with barrels and not in large bees, and that's where the fight started in 
1920s and 30s. Every I've I've talked to many of uh, many older beekeepers, guys like Ed Levi and other other older beekeepers who were doing little projects like that back in the 70s or back in the 60s or reading books off of Mike's website that talk about doing it back in the 30s and 20s and whenever. It 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 was being done back then. It can be done now. It works. But unless you do it for the whole thing, problem is we have this Varroa problem that a lot of people can't get over. Um, tracheal mites, for instance, nobody even treats for tracheal mites before because Varroa mites came along and everybody forgot about tracheal mites because they stopped treating for it and the bees started dealing with it on their own. Well, we're trying to get away from the Varroa mites now by bringing the dorsative type stuff and they go bigger to get another con game going. And they haven't succeeded yet. We can only hope. <laughs> so. One of the ones that I hear all the time is that I'm surrounded by commercial bees, so I can't be treatment free because I can't control the drones. Well, okay. I am also surrounded by commercial bees. In fact, if we had the, the, the map up, I could show you within half a mile that there's a commercial apiary right up the road from my main apiary. There's a, another apiary right down the street. There's another apiary a mile and a half beyond my other apiary. I'm literally surrounded. I'm pinned against the mountain by this commercial beekeeper in his yards in my valley. Small bees, if you can, once you get them established on small home, put down the big cell bees, and that's what they hate once you get enough volume going. And that's what I'm doing. I'm out competing their drones. small cell bees will put down with nature's help all the big bees in the area over time and kill them. And I proved that to the USDA with the climbing stuff. My bees, my bees are out competing. My drones are flying faster. They're, they're getting in there and getting that thing. And, and they, they must, you're not up there measuring how fast they fly. No, I'm not. This is all conjecture. I know none of this for. Yeah, you're conjecting because despite all of the commercial bees around you, and despite the pseudo fact that your queens should be getting mated to all those commercial queens, and that your resistance to mites should be going down to. Now I'm gonna have to bleep. Now I'm gonna have to bleep the video. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Small cell bees don't mate with. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's hard to just. They just don't want to hear how the small cell bees destroy the big ones with mating. And this is exactly the case because I am running small cell bees in the midst of treated commercial bees. The 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 beekeeper loves to call me up and tell me about how. He's treating and I should also be treating because it only costs three and a half cents per hive or whatever it costs uh, and how. Uh, so he, he asked me like, who, who, what was I breeding my bees from? And I said, well, the ones that survive. And so he had to one up that and say, well, I breed from the best of the ones that survive. I was just like, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in this case, change, change your expectations, change how you think how the, you think this works because it doesn't work the way that most people think it works. In 25 years of line breeding and isolated drone, uh, drone flooding, isolated breeding areas, instrumental insemination, nobody has produced a commercial treatment free bee. The one commercial operation that's made treatment free bees is Bee Weaver. How did they do it? They quit treating and a bunch of stuff died and they came back. That's how it's done. <laughs> For as little as one dollar a month, you can adopt a retard. This is, as you can see, the administrator of the commercial beekeeping group on Facebook. And this is me asking for money like a schmuck. Because <laughs> I don't make Okay, I make a lot of money on this, which is why I'm asking for money like a schmuck. Okay, let's just say it that way. Let's be sarcastic about it. I'm making so much money that I'm wearing this free t-shirt because I had a free t-shirt. <laughs> I'm, 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 I purposely put this shirt on. It's got little pot leaves on it. 
because it's a free t-shirt. I don't care what's on the front, it was free. And I like free stuff. But this is the kind of thing that you can, this literally happened, was this last week? Like this is not long ago, this is fresh. And for those of you watching on video, this is like the first week of March 2018, so this is happened last week, in case you're concerned. So what about uh, new areas? And we had the opportunity when, when Varroa became a big thing in this country and started killing a bunch of hives, we had the opportunity to let it take its course and we failed the test and we've been paying for it for the past 25 or 30 years. Uh, so what happens when it gets introduced to places like New Zealand? New Zealand's a good example, but first it got introduced to Hawaii. What happened in Hawaii? You had a big crash, a year or two later, the bees pop back up. Hawaii is a tropical area, so the bees can run year-round and, and breed a whole lot faster than they can in a more temperate climate, like um, further north in the United States, or place, you know, a very island, cool area like uh, New Zealand. So New Zealand went the same way we did, only they were, had access to treatments that were already developed. Treatments weren't really well developed in this country. They'd been in Europe, you know, you listen to uh, John Kiefus talking about developing the original use of Kumafos in, in France and how he eventually got away from that. You can hear that on my podcast, but um, you have the opportunity when it's introduced. First of all, don't introduce it into places, for crying out loud. But if you're going to, let it go. Let the problem happen. Mark talks about uh, South Africa where when it was introduced, they said, no, we're not going to treat. And it's not a problem anymore. The bees dealt with it and the problem is over. It takes a year or two, depending on the climate, maybe three, but generally two. You have a crash, you lose 80, 90, maybe even 95% in the worst case, and then it comes back. Right? It, that's just what it does. I don't have to prove it to you. I don't have to, I don't have to tell you why it is that way. Are, are, are you repeating here? Hmm? These mites have always been in New Zealand and here in Africa. All I'm saying is they became a problem at some point. Only when the English and the Europeans said bigger was better and tried to force everyone changing the laws to put new big cones in the hives to take control. All I'm saying is they became a problem at some point. We had the opportunity to not take the easy way out, it's in the old and we early didn't. Books, they were going to do it. It was outlined how they were going to do it in 20 year cycles. It's history. I've got the books on it. It was done automatically. Well, I'm, I, have, I have no opinion on that. I'm just saying when it became a problem, we had the opportunity to deal with it the right way, and well, we that's didn't. The new generation that's book trained. Because the ones still in the 80s weren't book trained, but the ones from the 80s on, that's when everything started with the new kids. New kids? Well, the new kids on the block. New kids on the block. I knew it was going there. <laughs> Wake up, stupid machine. All right, one of the ones that I hear that is just ridiculous that I've, I've been hearing for over a decade now is that there's no such thing as feral bees. So they do this by, first of all, by redefining feral as something that is wild or survives by itself in the wild. But look at the actual definition of feral. Wild, untamed, especially of domesticated animals having returned to the wild. Now, aside from the fact that bees aren't truly domesticated, uh, they are in the wild and I have, I mean, if you can't, <laughs> It gets frustrating sometimes because it's, it's like heavier than airships can't fly. At one point, people may have thought it's true, but it's never been true. There have always been feral bees. My great uncle Wayne kept bees for years and years and years out in a kind of an isolated pocket valley in Southern Oregon. And when Varroa became a problem, he didn't realize it. Nothing had changed for him. He just thought he had a bad year and a bunch of his hives died. No, but not all of them. That's the new escape, the best from the bigger is better junk. But the point is, not all of them died. Of 
once they were able to figure their program out, they came back and those bees are still there today. I, I'm trying to set up a yard in that area. There are wild bees, there are no beekeepers in that area. And I know because it's, I'm like related to everybody there. So like I know everybody there. <laughs> so I'm a, a sort of a, on one side of my family, I'm like the Southern Oregon redneck. On the other side of the family, they tell me I'm high class Swedish, which I'm told is like being the prettiest girl in the trailer park. <laughs> you know, some of us might live in a trailer park. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making any judgments. I'm just saying. A pretty girl is a pretty girl. I have never understand, never understood after all these years how it is possible that people can misspell the word hobbyist. They, they use it all the time. H hobbyist. You're the, you're the hobbyist what? You're the most hobby? I don't understand. It's, it's a Y. Hobbyist. Like apiarist. When it's, a, when it's an EST, that's like a most thing. I've never understood that one. I also never claim to be commercial. And considering that, that these people have only ever read my name, they've never met me in person and like heard me say my name, so they've only ever seen it spelled correctly, and yet they still spell it incorrect. I don't understand anything. I'm lost. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, your honey is not officially organic anymore because organic became a legally defined term in the early 2000s. And though through the, through the spirit of the term, yes, treatment-free honey is still organic. It still does not have all the nasty chemicals in it. It's still been raised ethically and sustainably and, and all the good stuff. But because it's now defined by you having to be able to control a certain radius around your area, which the vast majority of people cannot do because there's just not that big of organic swaths of land in this country. Unfortunately, you can't legally use the word organic anymore. Well, you do, <laughs> but it's always, it's always easier to ask forgiveness than permission though, right? What? It's always easier to ask forgiveness than permission. Just do what you want and when you get in trouble, then you deal with it. I've always done what I wanted, but they don't like it. Yeah, <laughs> I believe you. So to get the best money out of your honey, market, lo market local, give people taste tests. It's going to taste better than the other stuff. People aren't going to know why, because, you know, there are a lot of wine connoisseurs. There are not a lot of kind of honey connoisseurs, but a lot of people can tell, just about anybody can tell, that your honey tastes better than other people's honey. And when you tell them about how commercial honey is... Uh, commercial bees are treated, how honey is often imported from China through South America. Uh, your product is a better product, so get good money for it. So my concerns, I don't want to cater too much to, to worrying about stupid things, but you should be responsible with your bees. There's, there's a lot of people being concerned about newbies, but it's not the newbies fault. It's sort of the newbies fault. Um, but the most important thing is to be a good neighbor. You know, when you're arguing with people on the internet, which again, don't do, um, think of the long game. Don't be concerned with winning the argument or scoring one for your team. You know, with, with treatment free beekeeping and with dealing with, with people, dealing with laws, it's really good to know the rules, to, to have a framework from which to build your, the way you do things. You know, it's, it's good to follow the speed limit when you first learn to drive. When you get to be a better driver, you know, that's, it's not really a limit. Your car will go faster. How many more slides you got? I'm almost done. Oh, good. See, if I had less interruptions, I'd be done by now. <laughs> But ultimately, do whatever you're going to do. If you want to make a moral decision about breaking a rule or a law, it's your decision. It's not my responsibility. The other fun thing is when people make comments in stuff where I'm banned, 
the, all these people come out of the woodwork to tell me about what's going on in these other groups and they, they post me screenshots and some of these are screenshots. So I thought I would at one point put together a map of where the treatment free beekeepers were in the world and people literally took the time to put points all over this map spelling out obscene things. Like it takes a lot of points to make letters and spell out salami porker. <laughs> like salami porker across the entire Pacific Ocean. This is not, this actually happened. I actually still have the map. Maybe I'll, if, I'll show you if you come talk to me. I think it's just crazy. At one point I told people that um, American foul brood, like we all know in here, is not a death sentence that hybrid, hybrid uh, hygienic bees can deal with it. Uh, and I took all sorts of crap about that because people assumed that I was telling people not to do anything about American foul brood. Unless you're an expert, just follow the normal stuff and burn the hive and don't blame me. I say that all the time. Foul brood, all, all, all foul broods are beneficial. I agree with you. It's part of the natural process in the hive. It's natural. They but I don't want to be responsible for other people's problems. Uh, so this is the sort of comment that you might be expecting if you if you go out into the world and tell people you're treatment free So that one's fun. I Censored it for you because I didn't know that Joe was gonna be swearing So we're gonna have to no I'm kidding <laughs> One of the ones I hear all the time is if you're not gonna treat your bees Would you let your kid die? Would you let your dog die? If you can't tell the difference between a child and an insect, like there's no argument that can be had here. I'm a human. I'm a speciesist. I believe that humans are more important than other creatures. Now that's not the case for everybody. That's the case for me. <laughs> um, you know, there's the old story about the, uh, who was it, the, the Indian religion that was totally against violence. Was it Jains or? You know what I'm talking about? Anyway, so they avoided getting into any sort of agriculture because they were concerned about accidentally stepping on animals and whatnot, which fair enough, whatever you want to do. So they got into mining and mining became this big thing that destroyed the environment, did the exact opposite of what they had intended to do originally. So of course, treatment free is like uh, every other pseudoscience that you may have heard of. It's, you know, we're all magical here. Um, it's, it's our fault because we're part of the, the, the young of today who are rejecting science and that's just bogus. Treatment free beekeeping and the concepts behind it are based on the most basic concept in biology and that's natural selection. Well basically did they not just accuse treatment free beekeepers of bringing polio back? <laughs> I mean you could say that. Isn't that kind of what they're saying? They're you saying could. Their kids would send polio back. That's mm -hmm. kind of what they just do make these have polio because they walk around with holy <coughs> legs and they keep. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. Well, you've got to. <laughs> if you don't treat your bees, they're going to die. No. Okay. Um, this person has obviously is more than a 0% loss rate because everybody does and obviously they treated so what happened you, you missed right and when when I'm consistently losing 5 to 20% of my hives year after year after year which is lower than the national average how much better do I have to get like what do I have to do like I'm not having the problem that you're having why is it my fault you need to get down to one or two I would, I'm working on it. I got to breed out all those dopey bees. It takes some time. Here's the example I love to use. This is backyard beekeepers because that's all I care about because that's the people that I talk to. Uh, all states, all years. This is the average loss rate, the difference. So obviously people who are not treating are not getting 100% <coughs> losses. People who are treating are not getting 0% losses. And for the amount of work and the cost that goes into treating and the contaminated comb and, the contaminated comb and all the other gunk and, and all of that, 
If you have 10 hives, statistically speaking, all that work is gonna net you one less hive lost in a year. On average, that's a statistical thing. I mean, it's not literally gonna happen that way, but that's statistically how that works out. All the treating saves you one hive out of 10. Newbies shouldn't start treatment free. It's too complex, it's too hard. They should start treating. Just get it, treat them, make them survive, and then you can play around treatment free later if you want. Look, it's like riding a bicycle. If you start riding a unicycle, you're gonna be really good at riding a unicycle, even though it's harder than riding a bicycle. But because it's how you learned and it's what you did, that's what you do. They say that. It's, it's, it is, easier. It is. In, a, in, in the, I spend so much less time and have so much more fun. To me, it is easier than treating. Doesn't cost any money. Doesn't, I can stay out of the hives more. Yeah, I'm totally with you. Yeah. But you did a lot more, a lot more research before you even bought these. Maybe. And, and that sets you up disproportionately to someone who does no research and just goes and buys these. Right, but how, that's, yeah, that's their issue. I can't, I can't, I mean, if it were me, I would have people, uh, I, you know, I recommend people not get bees until the year after they decide they want to be a beekeeper. Give them plenty of time to figure it out, go visit other beekeepers. What I'm getting at is there's an assumption here that when someone starts out beekeeping, they start out with bees, they don't start out doing the research. Oftentimes they do. And I try, to, I try to stop that, but I'm only one man. You have been booted from treatment-free beekeeping for calling people Nazi. Yeah, well, you're a Nazi. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Nothing I can do here. Obviously, I've lost the argument. Uh, newbies die. Newbies die. <laughs> New bees die. <laughs> New bees, bees die, and that makes people depressed, and they buy more bees, and then they die, and they buy more bees, and they die. You do that about three or four times, and you're going to give up beekeeping. That's absolutely true. But new drivers crash cars, new fishermen lose fish, new parents drop babies. I have never dropped a baby. Why hmm? Nazi? Because somebody called me a Nazi. You're not a zealous bee. Never mind. No, I'm not. But people call me names. I just have to let it roll off. How do you spell Nazi? How do I spell Nazi? N-A-Z-I? Not a zealous intellect. <laughs> well, it's, it's a shortened version of National Socialist from German. Well, you're not a zealous person. That has, you know. Well, yeah, but. High intellect. That guy doesn't know that. Well, you have to explain it to him. <laughs> I could, but I have, you know, other things to do. It's easier to just take them off. It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> you can't call people Nazis in the group. It's just, you can't, I'm not, yeah. You used to laugh at that name. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately, it's not, it's not, it's your job as a beekeeper, and I'm talking to nobody in this room because it doesn't apply to any of you. It's, it's your job as a beekeeper to get the information you need to learn the stuff you need to learn to do this right. Yeah. I'm a kook. Uh, and apparently he would have left the group by himself, which they rarely ever do, but they say they will. And then they hang around to wait for a comment yeah. about how they're gonna leave and then they re-comment about how they're still going to leave and screw you because I'm leaving. And then they, they wait around for you to comment again. And then they comment because they still haven't left. Yeah. Now, I don't know why Captain America had to say this, but that's what happened. Treatment free is impossible. This is kind of the same thing as, as I'm surrounded by commercial beekeepers, except for it's Alaska. But I've been to Alaska just in, uh, just in January, went up there and did a symposium. And there are treatment free beekeepers in Alaska. Oh, yeah, and I became right. friends with some of them. And I get reports on how well their bees are surviving. That's and right. That's normal beekeepers. Michael's been up there for Michael. 
people. They are great people. Would you let a hive die rather than treat even just once? Yes, I would, because I have more. And if they die, I know how to get more for free. And so I don't need it. Treatment-free beekeeping, per, com, per, treatment -free commercial beekeeping is impossible. Now, treatment-free migratory beekeeping, where they take them all to almonds every year, that may be impossible. I don't know. We Nobody's do doing that. it. And then they prohibited us because we were full killer bees and couldn't go over there. Yeah. To the almonds. Um, but there are plenty of commercial stationary beekeepers who make honey, make queens. Yeah. D is a good example. Uh, shut you down and write a law saying you can't do it. Kirk Webster. Uh, there's several up in his area who are kind of his protégés. Um, Corey, what's his last name? I just talked to on the podcast in Missouri. There are commercial beekeepers. They're just not going to almonds. There's even, uh, what's his name, that guy that goes from Texas to North Dakota? He's treatment free. I forget his name, but, but yeah, it's possible. So I created a group called Treatment Free Commercial Beekeepers to talk to treatment free commercial beekeepers. Where did uh, this you is this at? it's on Facebook. I created a group and I can't even post on there. I'm still fighting it because every time I post, I get most of it deleted. I don't know. I, that's Facebook. That's not me. And Facebook will tell me. They're afraid I'll get me. So again, we have, why are you not working? We have hobbyist. Again, I, I see this over and over. Why can't people spell hobbyist? <laughs> We're all typing away on phones that have autocorrect, and yet we can't get the word hobbyist right. Um, oh, I'm an occultist. That's a good one. You're what? I'm an occultist. Really? Yeah. I don't even know what that means. I'm a, oh, I'm a witch. I mean, I, I guess this guy assumed that because I'm starting a cult of treatment-free beekeepers, then I'm an occultist, which is, again, two separate things. And this just shows you the level of, of intellectual ability that we're up against. Um, I'm also very liberal, not because I hold liberal beliefs, but because I'm an occultist or I, because I'm a disagree or whatever. It's, it's not liberal as a definition, it's liberal as an insult. Whatever, it's not, it's not useful. Um, I have only 28 members in my group, which has 48 members. At the time, it's got way more now. He kind of said it backwards on here. He says you're very liberal, um, his way or the highway. Yeah, my way or no way. How is, it his way or the, how is his way or the highway liberal? That's exactly right. That's more fascist, which is the other way. <laughs> no, this is what group is this in? It's not my group. One of the other. I think this is commercial beekeeping. Um, we're a bunch of clowns trying to save the world. I mean, we could if we put face paint on, then that might work. Um, Treatment-free and commercial beekeepers don't go together because it's an oxymoron, which we've discussed in the last slide. Uh, there was one more. At least you got my name spelled right, so that was good. And hobbyist. So, my conclusions. One of my favorite quotes, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. <laughs> this is the case in so many things. This is why I'm against, especially hobbyist beekeepers, spending money on bees. Because when you bring money into things, it affects, even if you try not to, it still yeah, affects there things. There's so many grants to universities now because of the first paragraph there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a commercial migratory treatment or treating beekeeper. So you don't, and, and none of my audience for the most part is either, except for Jacob. So you don't have to keep bees that way. You can choose different hives. You can choose different methods. You don't have to be anything. You can do it however you want. 
So talking with people on the internet, don't argue. Again, it doesn't work. You're not going to change anybody's mind. You're just going to make somebody mad. Show, don't tell. You know, show your experience. I've been doing this for such and such years. I have this many hives. This is what's happening. You can't argue with facts. You, you aren't entitled to your own facts. Always be honest because they're going to find out if you're lying, if you're being inconsistent. Now, if they're going to, you're going to get all sorts of people who are going to twist your words and make it sound like you're being, um, being hypocritical. That's going to happen all the time. There's nothing you can do about that. But if you are wrong, as happens with me all the time, just admit it. Once you've admitted it and you get past it, it just falls by the wayside. But if you don't admit it and someone calls you on it and you don't admit it, they're going to paint you with it. One of the, one of the really important things that I've learned with talking to people is always repeat what they say in a way that they would say it, in the way that they would agree with. Because if you're repeating something in a way that they don't agree with, you're just building a straw man. It's a straw man argument. You're arguing against something they're not saying and it's not going to make any difference to them because it doesn't, it's not them. You're arguing against something else. Some of you may have seen this uh, interview on YouTube. Yes. This is, uh, this is Jordan Peterson. So it's a, it's a 20 minute long interview where she asks him a question. He says, okay, this is, this is what I'm saying. And then she says, oh, so you're saying, and then she twists it and makes something else out of it. And it's a perfect example of a bad way to talk to somebody. Now I have no views on Jordan Peterson. Don't care. It's not, I'm not getting into that. It's just a good example of a bad argument and also vegans. <laughs> Keep doing what you're doing. Keep keeping your bees. The most important thing is that you keep doing what you're doing, not that you prove it to somebody, not that you spread it around. By doing what you're doing, people will come to you and they'll see what you're doing and they'll want to know why it's working. And just tell them why it's working. Don't try to prove that it's working. Don't try to, to, to force them into believing you. That's the old way with you all and all the original ones back 20, 30 years ago. And be nice, because that always helps. That's all I got. Good. I was thinking, well, don't wrestle with the pig. <laughs> don't wrestle with the pig, because you both get dirty and the pig likes it. Well, I guess it's time to quit. So, you would recommend people don't buy these, even from treatment-free Yes. If they're not in your area, but if they are in your area, you would say that's okay? I tell people, don't buy bees, even if I'm selling them, but if you're going to blow your money, give it to me. <laughs> okay, so... If you, if you insist, if you insist on risking your money and ruining your beekeeping experience, buy local. So what you're saying is we should kill all the vegans? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I didn't always. I, there was, I mean, Mike can remember back in the early days when I, I spent my entire senior year of college arguing with people on the internet, making a huge mess of things. Yeah, I was, I mean, this, this knowledge did not come through success. It came through failure. Don't be, don't misunderstand. I'm, I'm preaching to myself here.